please can you welcome your host for this evening, Quentin Cooper. Good evening, good evening. Thank you for coming along. So welcome one and all, short and tall, to Hall of Fame Lab, whether you are geeky, freaky, cheeky, cliquey, past your peaky, near antiquey, or none of the above, or several, so long as you are remotely psi curious, you are in for a treat. Or more accurately, multiple treats, um, because we're going to be seeing six different talented fame labbers. Uh, we're also being videoed as well, apparently. We're not being live streamed and videoed, so if you're watching on the video, wherever the video is, hello. I hope you've got something good to do for the next hour. So I'm Quentin Cooper, tweeting is at QWERTY. I am your genial host for this Hall of Fame Lab showdown meets hoedown. As you're probably aware, this is part of European Researchers' Night. So you can think of Hall of Fame Lab as being a kind of brief, entertaining interlude in the interminable tragic comedy that is Brexit. A bit of <laughs> some symbolic science defiance celebrating all we have done, are doing, and will continue to do working across Europe and despite the maelstrom of stupid that we're being sucked into. Or you can think of it as fitting in perfectly with tonight's World Wide Web's theme, an elaboration on collaboration and the, the border-busting interconnectedness that is at the very heart of modern science. You can think of it as either of those or both, but you can also more simply and possibly more accurately think of it as being a revved up, boiled down, fun-sized version of the world's biggest, woo, longest running, woo, thank you, and most Calipigian science communication competition. Woo! That was meant to be the puzzle woo, but it was actually the loudest, that was good as well. So who here has had some previous with Fame Lab and has been to some version of it before? Do this by hands rather than wooing. I don't want you all wooed out too early on. Okay, who, I'm glad that the Fame Labbers have, that's good. Okay, who hasn't but thinks they've got a reasonable idea of what they're in for? Okay, so by a process of elimination that means quite a lot of you are completely new to this. Stick your hands up if you are, I'm not going to drag you on stage. Whoa, what a lot of novices, that's great, okay. Well, welcome. The good news, you might be at this point thinking, oh my god, it's a Mooney cult. But it's not, it's not. So Fame Lab goes, it's been with us pretty much all century. It started at the Cheltenham Science Festival as being a UK only attempt to try and encourage talented scientists, young and old, to be a bit more confident being on a stage and presenting to the general public. British Council came along early on and with their help, they have taken it to literally dozens of countries on every continent on the planet barring Antarctica and we are still working on Antarctica with the help of the British Antarctic Survey. But CERN have run their own version of this. NASA have run their own version of this. They actually, one of their finals was hosted by Nichelle Nichols, the original Lieutenant Uhura in Star Trek. That's also worth a woo, I think. I think so too. But in the UK, you get me. So that's the, that's the long of it. But people from Fame Lab have gone on to permeate all sorts of things. There are science ministers, there are science advisors. Longest running science show in the world on TV, Sky at Night, Maggie Adair in Pocock, one of the presenters, ex Fame Lab, most successful science comedy group in the UK, Festival of the Spoken Nerd, two thirds of them, ex Fame Labbers. And it's pretty much the same right across the planet. There are lots of people who are ex Fame Labbers who've gone on to be involved. Literally tens of thousands of people have taken part in the competition in various ways. And it's, as I say, it's been going now for the best part of 15 years. Now, what you're getting tonight is a kind of best of edition, a kind of out of competition, but slightly in competition, six experienced fame labbers from across Europe. And they'll follow the same rules as we always have. They'll have three minutes to give you something entertaining, a bit of the wow and the how, a bit of the wonder and the thunder of science. Then they'll have to face two minutes of judges' questions, and then we'll move on. And I think that is pretty much all you need to know before I introduce the aforementioned judges, except possibly what Calipigian means. Now this being a Natural History Museum European Researchers Night audience, I reckon there's a better than average chance that we've got somebody in this audience who knows what Calipigian means. Or then again, maybe we don't. Okay, Calipigian is from the Greek, and it means possessing beautiful buttocks. So try to work it into your everyday conversation in the week ahead. 
without getting arrested, as I will do now. So let's meet our judges, and we're going to start with former advisor on public engagement in science for the British Council, including being head of all things Fame Labby. He is now director of skills and education for charity the Lloyds Register Foundation, the extremely Calipigian, Tim Slingsby. Uh, next, and probably more likely than most to actually know what Calipigian means, because it's Greek and so is she, we have a school-skilled science communicator, a former teacher. She's now a partnership manager at digital education platform FutureLearn. She's also a TEDx trainer, and most importantly, she's a former FameLab Greece finalist. Please welcome onto our tiny stage the equally Calipigian, but born near the Aegean, Christina Melinou. And a final judge got her A-level in computing aged 11, making her the youngest girl ever to pass it. Her master's in maths and computer science from Oxford by the time she was 20. Since then, she's done all sorts of prestigious work in banking and computing, got a whole load of honorary doctorates and fellowships. But alongside this, she's also co-founded and run the award-winning STEMETs, which, in their own words, are all about showing the next generation that girls do science, technology, engineering, maths, to at our free, fun, food-filled experiences. Plus, on Wednesday, Computer Weekly published their list of the most influential women in tech 2019. And guess who's at number two? Applause, please, for the also equally Calipigian, Anne-Marie Imaphidon. So first of all, judges, thank you. And I take it you're, none of you are remotely disturbed. You've been called Calipigian many times before, I'm sure, all three of you. Um, so Anne-Marie, congratulations on the Computer Weekly thing. Does it, I mean, it's nice. Does it make a big difference? Is it helpful? Does it get you out there? Does it get more people to interact with the STEMettes? Hopefully. Um, yeah, it's just it, number two. I don't know, as a number in general. <laughs> right. So it's taken me a while. Are you uh, saying two because it's not one or two because it's just number two? Two because right. it's, it's not one. And um, so my response to it is uh, kind of the only way is up, hopefully. Yeah. Finish. And I presume also you pr probably ultimately wouldn't you be more comfortable being just on a list of most important people in tech rather than most important women in tech, which kind of... A list is a list is a list, isn't it? Uh, it's philosophically hard to argue with that as a, as a proposition, so I'll, I'll, I'll let it just hang there as well. And about the STEMETs, tell us a little bit more about the STEMETs, because not been going that long, but hugely influential. Yeah, six years, 40,000 girls and young women across the UK, Ireland and parts of Europe, and the free food fun thing has taken us quite far. Who likes free food? Yeah, it's kind of this. Well, there's none tonight. There we go. That's, how we, that's how we lure them in, and then we, we slap them with the, with the science, technology, engineering, and maths, metaphorically speaking, physically speaking. Um, and uh, it's a lot of fun, but a lot of opening up where STEM happens and what it looks like and who does STEM in a way that we don't get to see. So you're trying to change some of those geek stereotypes, but are you also trying to change the stereotypes about geek food as well? When you give them food, is it not pizzas and not? It's not, yeah, it's Good. not always pizzas, actually, funnily enough. I mean, we're not trying to change the stereotype about geeks, per se. We're just kind of trying to broaden the perspective of who does STEM. You could be a geek, you could not be a geek, you could be a bit in the middle, but trying to show that it's something that everyone can be a part of and can do. Now, we've established that Tim and Christina have history with Fame Lab. You're the new kid here. How much do you know about what on earth you've got yourself into tonight? Very little, but I guess most of the people in the audience are, are in the same boat as me. Yeah, but most of the audience, people in the audience aren't one of the judges. So there's, there's a crucial distinction there, I feel. So what are you, what are you going to be looking out for that's going to distinguish between these six experienced fame labs? So I'm going to be looking for clarity and charisma. Um, I think that's that's kind of what the fame lab brand um, and says. Content to me. is the, those are the three official criteria. Content think, is if the you last want to focus one. on clarity and charisma and forget about content, that's Yeah, good. I think I, between <laughs> the three of us, if I cover two of them, then there's a high chance that we'll, we've got it all covered. Right. Us. And Tim, tell us, we've mentioned that you were with Fame Lab, British Council, now you're at the Lloyd Register Foundation. I'm guessing it's not the most high profile charity because I think you've only been going, what, six, seven years. So yeah. tell us a little bit about it. So Lloyd's Register Foundation is only six or seven years old, but it's got uh, two and a half centuries of history behind it. Lloyd's Register Foundation is the charity that's the sole shareholder of the Lloyd's Register Group. Lloyd's Register Group was um, the world's first ship's classification organisation. 1760. 
Yes, and through those years, it's grown and morphed into a group of companies around the world that exist basically to make the world a safer place. And in that way, uh, the foundation shares that mission. So the foundation exists to make the world a safer place through engineering-related research, outreach, education, engagement, and things like that. Right, I like the way, if you notice the heart touching, like a footballer who's recently been transferred to a new club, <laughs> yeah. pledging his loyalty to the badge. But when you say, I mean, there's obviously a lot of charities out there, your, your particular kind of focus is making the world safer. Does that yes. mean safer from what? Everything from, from disease, from technology, from crazy politicians, from what? It's a good question and, and one that we asked ourselves. So if we, if we exist to make the world a safer place, then there's two questions that come from that. One is, well, what do we mean by safety? Another one is, in whose eyes is the world a safer place? So what we've decided we mean by safety is the interface between people and infrastructure. And infrastructure, as far as we're concerned, is, can be something big and hairy, like an offshore platform, or it could be something relatively intangible, like a food supply chain. Uh, and in whose eyes is the world a safer place? Well, we exist to benefit society, so the world has to be a safer place in society's eyes. And in that space, one of the things we're doing to try and understand what people around the world think and feel about risk is the world's first ever global risk gallop. So as part of Gallup's world poll, and this is whoever the year we find out, for example, somewhere in Scandinavia is the happiest nation in the world, where for the first time working out what people around the world think and feel about risk. I would say if you're really worried about risk, maybe you shouldn't have the poll with Gallup, you should have it with Cantor or Trot instead. But, uh, I thought it was great. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Christina, now, I don't want to drag you back to ancient history, being Greek, but it's a while since you did Fame Lab. It's more so than ten. You then. were a child. You yes. were a toddler. I know. Yes. But are you amazed that it's still, after all this time, how it's grown and evolved? That it's still because I was I was there doing the master class in Greece this year, and they're still very actively involved. Actually, I'm not amazed. Um, Fame Lab is an amazing idea. If you're thinking about doing it, absolutely go ahead. So when I took part, which was back in 2008, you could tell this was going to be big. Back then it was just 10 countries. Now it's about around 30 countries that have been involved at various different stages. And the amazing thing is that it's not just the competition. You don't just go there, present on the night, and that's over and done with. It's an entire network of people. So you meet other people, you get opportunities to get involved with various activities. So it's literally an ongoing thing. We are all part of a fame lab community. So the alumni stay in touch and elite yeah. across the world. We have a Facebook group to prove it, so. You know. And finally, given that these are six experienced <coughs> fame labbers, what are you gonna be looking out for tonight from? I mean, beyond content, clarity, charisma, because they're all gonna have a bit of that. What's gonna make the difference between a Hall of Fame lab participant and a Hall of Fame lab winner? For me, the thing that I always look for in a presentation is, does it make me want to Google it when I go back home? Does it like, oh, I absolutely need to know more about this, so I absolutely need to go and Google it when I go back home and find out more? Two, I've asked everybody else, so it's only fair I ask you. It gives the last clue to our participants. Yeah, I think, I think rather similarly. I, I, I like the presentations that, that I, get, I get disappointed when they stop. I want to hear more. So uh, anything that's got me on the edge of my seat, which I'm sure all of the presenters will do, is, is good in that. And they do have to stop at three minutes sharp as well. We have, we have, if they go over, they will hear this threatening sound. And obviously nobody can proceed on after they've heard that. Okay, it's a tough job, so can we please all hail our supreme team of judges for the work that we do. Yes, hail supreme, we know. And now after all, six fame lovers and other judges are deliberating, we're gonna have a little bit of a very important thing in these days that we live in, uh, and we have an unprorogable democratic event, the audience vote. So we're gonna do it just on how much noise you make. We'll get to the details later, but all I'm saying is now, please pay attention on when you're watching all six because we want your vote, and we don't want you to vote, we want you to vote not on who you know best, who you'd like to know best, who you think would look best in a vest. None of those criteria. Vote on who you think has actually done the best presentation and coped best with the judges' questions, okay? So are we all generally clear about what's happening? That's the mumble of yesness. Okay, there is no need to bring in the Supreme Court. Then great, we'll go. First, by the forces of randomness and repetition, we have our Fame Labber from Ireland, just as we did in Hall of Fame Lab 2018. But it's a different Fame Lab. This is 2019 winner of the Cork Heat and finalist Louisa Vashevska. Uh, Louisa says she's fascinated by food science 
and is currently at University College Cork, working with the Tyndall National Institute there and the Irish State Food Agricultural R&D Agency, which is spelt T-E-A-G-A-S-C, T-E-A-G-A-S-C, but is pronounced, I think, Chagusk, or something like that. Louisa may know, but then again she may not, because as you might have guessed from her name, she's originally from Poland where she's got a degree in dietetics. I mean, you could have guessed she's from Poland, not that she's got a good degree in dietetics. Now, that's not what's turned into a food science obsessive, though. She says it was while she was studying for her first degree, uh, she worked part-time in a restaurant where, quote, food safety standards were at the bottom of the priority list. <laughs> that led to Louisa doing a master's in food safety in the Netherlands, then working in an agricultural research institute in France before ending up in Ireland, where she's working to develop a biosensor to speed up detecting E. coli in beef. She says the great thing about Ireland is the grass is always green, the cows are always happy, and the team meetings are usually in the pub. Plus, it's a long, long way from that terrible restaurant in Poland. So serve up a big helping of applause, please, for our first Fame Lover of the Evening, Louisa Oszewska. You cannot see them, but they can see you. On the day you were born, they said yes, to be with you for better and worse, in sickness and health, and not even death will do you part. I'm talking about the microorganisms, which are little creatures which whole body is only one single cell, like the bacteria or virus. After years of negative publicity, they finally managed to get some good one. Hashtag, eat probiotics. Hashtag, feed your gut bacteria. Unfortunately, they still seem to be forgotten in the whole discussion about how to deal with the climate change. While understanding their invisible web is actually crucial for our be or not to be on this planet. You may be surprised, but 90% of all the life forms in the ocean are microbial. It means that if the audience was the ocean, only the first two rows would be all the life forms that we can see, like the fishes, and the rest of you would be the microorganisms. And some of them can be actually very useful for us. So there, is, uh, there are organisms called phytoplankton, which would be compared to the tiny trees, because just like the trees, they use photosynthesis to get the energy. It means that they get the carbon dioxide and produce the oxygen. In fact, they produce as much oxygen as all the plants on the earth. I wonder why we never hear about any campaign to plant the phytoplankton. On the other hand, there are microorganisms which breathe just like us, so they consume oxygen and produce carbon dioxide. I guess that every one of you will agree with me that we don't need more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. However, when the temperature on the Earth continue to rise, the, con the living conditions in the ocean will change, also the availability of the food. It will start some kind of a zombie apocalypse where all these microorganisms will compete to get this food and only the strongest one will survive. Will our little trees be strong enough? Or are they going to be replaced with the carbon dioxide producer to make the snowball of climate change even grow? Our predictions about this are not very optimistic. But if we get more knowledge about how this invisible web work, we can try to direct this apocalypse into our faith. But first, we have to convince more people that even though we cannot see something, it can still be powerful. Hashtag see the invisible. Hashtag save the planet. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what we might be doing to turn the, the tide in our favor. So more, more phytoplankton that, that consumes CO2 rather than the microorganisms that produce it. 
uh, yeah, so this is one of the things that actually we need more people to work on that to understand how it works. Because the problem is also that if we maybe, I was thinking that this could be, this seems like an option to introduce more phytoplankton, but then it also kind of, uh, there is the equilibrium that we also need, so maybe we will mess up a bit with that, so there has to be definitely more research. Also, the problem is that in the oceans there are some parts uh, that also is growing where there is lack of oxygen and these parts are actually growing in the oceans and microorganisms actually cannot grow there, either any organism. So there is a lot of more knowledge that we have to, we have to get to actually be able to, to know what to do to deal with that. Um, I, I've got loads more questions, but I can't think of both my fellow <laughs> teachers. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I was thinking while you're presenting, and thank you for the presentation, um, if we are to interfere with the balance in the oceans, A, you said we need more research, but mm -hmm. is any actual research being done now, and won't it be more expensive or risky, because I know you love that, um, <laughs> then working on systems that we understand better, like um, systems, you know, in like the atmosphere, perhaps? Uh, so, so Basically, my question is, do we know the oceans well enough to interfere with their balance, or would, we, would a safer bet mm -hmm. be to actually work on land systems or the atmosphere where we understand them better? Do we understand the ocean well enough? I think there, there is a lot of research going on as well about the ocean. But the problem is that also some of the methodology, for example, there are different groups working on different, maybe even about the same, but using different methodology. So some conclusions would be the opposite. So this is also the problem that more scientists should work together to, to solve this. Because actually there are some conclusions that are completely opposite, for example, if the if the plankton is growing or, or actually reducing their so this is this is the, the problem to actually have more people maybe working together. So Can we please again yeah. thank our first friend like the So as well as doing science, as well as doing entertainment, don't forget that a lot of these phone members are also doing this in their second or third language. Also very brave of Louisa to insult 90% of the audience by calling you all microbial. But anyway, you get the general idea to, to continue Louise's sort of food theme. This is a sort of smorgasbord, only we have without the board bit. Uh, they have three minutes of them to enlighten, two minutes for our judges to frighten, three minutes for them to illuminate, two minutes for them to interrogate, and so we move on. And in this case, we're going to move on to our FameLab Switzerland 2018 winner and FameLab International finalist, uh, Dmitry Kopolyansky. Now, I should explain to the many of you who are new to FameLab that there's a special Swiss tradition. They always take part. Uh, sometimes there's even a special CERN version of FameLab as well, Swiss Hole. But they almost never have a winner or even many finalists who are actually from Switzerland. Uh, and Dmitry maintains this tradition because he's actually from Russia. Uh, after studying at Moscow Medical Academy, uh, he became fascinated by tropical diseases, as you do. It says it took him two years to finally realize there are not so many of them in Russia, which led him to go to slightly more tropical parts of the world like Israel, Germany, and then Switzerland. I did say slightly more tropical. Now, since taking part in FameLab, Dmitry himself has become infected with the science communication bug, doing talks, being on panels, and even moderating events, which, as you know, is the hardest and most high level of all skills. Yes, I think so. Uh, now, uh, all he says, he says, by telling scientific stories is the basis of this, and he says, by telling these stories, we drive research forward, we bring it to the public, we inspire future generations of scientists. And now, he's here to spread the word, but not disease. So bring your hands together, and then wash them carefully, for our Russian Switzerland 2018 FameLab winner, Dmitry Kopolyansky. By the way, when you have an infection, 
you're not alone. You've got your immune system that protects you. Let me briefly tell you how it works. Imagine inside a beautiful day, you're walking on the street, you hate it, and then suddenly, <laughs> fly, a pathogen that comes with this. Get off me, you're trying to kill it. But what do you know about this fly? Well, so far, you know nothing. You don't know if it's poisonous or not. You know if it bites or stinks. You don't even know to which kind of biological species it belongs to. But do you really care? Nah. All you want is just to get rid of this as quick as you can. And this is your innate immune response. It is very rapid, but very unspecific. And in many cases, this is not enough. But while you're doing this, you're actually learning something about this fly. You're learning how fast it can move. You're learning on which height it flies. You can sort of predict where it will be in a second. And then you focus, you gather your strength, and you kill it. And this is your adaptive immune response, which is targeted, which is precise, but it is still. So this is how the system works. So in my research, I work with Leishmania. It's a tropical parasite. It gets inside our bodies, inside our cells, and it starts dividing. And usually, disease appears in the form of a skin lesion. Normally, our immune system is able to protect us. But I work with a very special case that targets the face. And there, this parasite, doesn't come alone. It comes with a friend, another pathogen, a virus. You see, many, many years ago, these two guys, the parasite and the virus, they met, they liked each other, and they decided to live together in this sort of pleasure. In fact, the virus lives inside the parasite and their friends. So when the parasite with the virus gets inside our bodies, inside our cells, our innate immune system doesn't see it as a fly, but it sees it as a huge, scary monster, and it's just like, starts panicking, going crazy, like this, unstoppable. Yes. It goes completely out of control and starts destroying our own tissue. And by the time we realize what's going on, there's not only one fly in the one place, but many, many more around because parasites use this time to multiply and spread. Eventually, our immune system is able to protect us. But by that moment, we slapped ourselves so many times, it's almost not tasty. And that's how amazing the nature is, because two pathogens can meet and decide to live and work together to become a super pathogen, because they're stronger together. Unfortunately, there is still no vaccine, and the drug treatments are limited. But I believe that scientists can resist this infection if they also work together. And we need your help. So I'm asking all of you right now to help us fight this disease. So please raise your hands. Both of them. Do it. Come on. And together with me, start practicing your adaptive immune response. Thank you. Thank you, Dmitri. Um, I have lots of questions, but one that is really bugging me since you started talking. Uh, this thing about flies spreading disease. So, as you know, you're a scientist, you understand like, how disease spreads. Um, do you think we should like get rid of any any like insect in our house? Or because you know, like I don't want to kill everything I see, but if they're like working together, bugs and parasites, I need to know this now. <laughs> so this particular disease is yes transmitted by sand fly, but only in tropical areas. So as long as you're here, you're safe. If you're talking about uh, other insects. I mean, it's hard to say. I, I don't think that the insects that live in particularly in the UK, in your house, I hope there are no insects, by the way, but if there are some, I think you're safe. But when I go on holiday... Don't kill them for fun, right? Yeah. When you're on holiday, yeah, I mean, depending where you go, there are certain parts of the world, such as uh, South America or Africa, where you need to be particularly careful, uh, because diseases such as Leishmania, parasites, or malaria, they spread to your sand flies or mosquitoes, and then, yes, you need to take necessary precautions like insecticides or special nets that you, you know, put around your bed. Uh, Dimitri, I want to ask you about this tropical diseases and this, this tropical parasites in particular. Um, given where you have been and the, the journey that you've been on to, to discover this and, and investigate it, why this one in particular? Um, especially given your, your nowhere near tropical <laughs> environments. Um, yeah, I mean, so as Quentin introduced, so I studied medicine first, and then I got interested in tropical disease. I think I had this idea of uh, you know, going to developing countries and helping people there, and then I kind of mm, got really fascinated by research. And in this particular case, uh, I think it's a neglected tropical disease, and it's called neglected 
not because uh, nobody gets sick, there are around 18 million people uh, getting sick every year. It is neglected because it affects developing countries, so terrible countries, and big pharma corporations, they have no interest in that. And I mean, this is maybe one part why I think research in this area is important. For me, particularly this research was important because this is the symbiotic relationship between two organisms. And actually there are many examples of such a cooperation in the nature. This one is relevant because it, it is the human disease. And actually now people starting to understand more and more how these kind of coexisting pathogens, how they have effect on our health. Symbiotic relationship between audience questions and time. So we have to say goodbye to Dmitry Kowalski. <laughs> He knows all about infection, but will he be the selection of our judges? We will find out soon enough. I'd also say he also gives a final new meaning to that old English phrase, slaphead, as well. So, uh, two down, four to go, and the first of our remainder is Romania, and their 2019 finalist, Melina Strugaru. Now, as well as being one of my favourite anagrams of the evening, Melina Strugaru turns out to be singular trauma. Uh, uh, she's just finished her first year as a physics student. She says she loves all science, but her favourite is physics because it gives her the highest ratio of daily aha moments. And it's these aha moments, she says, that make her keep falling in love with science over and over again. And Melina says that whoever is around her then becomes the group of friends she gossips with about her latest crush. So, for the next three minutes, consider yourselves befriended by 2019 Fame Lab Romania finalist and singularly traumatic Melina Strigaru. Let me tell you a good one. Billy the Miner walks into the mine with a solar power headlamp. This sounds like the beginning of a joke to many of us. Even Billy himself is quite in the dark about what good his decision might bring. Like, Oh boy, I'm going under. What on the... Let's put it on hold for a bit. And focus on what those things on his head should do. Each of those solar cells contains two plates of silicon, a very useful material in electronics. One plate, one of the plates, has more negative charge or more electrons, negative particles, making it the sad, pessimistic plate. While the other has more positive charge, making it the happy, optimistic plate. Now, when light particles, or photons, come to the cell plate, they pick up an electron, grab him by his collar, and kick him out of, the, of, the, of there, sending him directly to the happy plate, not without the motherly threatening, get over yourself. Now, as more and more photons come to the cell plate and offer their rough yet efficient emotional support, more electrons flow between the two plates, creating what we know as an electric current and with it come power and energy. Well, these things work wonderfully in sunny places, but we still have our man Billy biting his nails while descending into the mines, right? Now's the dramatic plot twist when I tell you that Billy is wearing no ordinary cells, but some with bacteria instead of those silicon plates. These bacteria are coated in a layer of a material similar to the silicon I told you before about, and are genetically engineered, or taught to produce large amounts from a dye called lycopene, the one coloring our tomatoes red. This dye, when degraded, releases electrons, creating that electron flow I told you we call electric curve. And now for the best part, it takes a very, very small amount of light to degrade this lycopene light, thus making Billy solar cells work even in dim lit places. Think like powering devices in cloudy countries or underwater exploration. The only thing that's missing for now is a way to keep those bacteria alive while producing the solar cells so they can make their dye indefinitely and wouldn't need to be replaced so often. Until then, however, we still have a pretty cool way of powering devices and Billy's just came back from the mines uh, and his testimony goes like this. Well, physics, chemistry, and biology got together and kept me safe and sound. Thank you. Thank you there, Melina. Um, extended jokes are one of my, my favorite.
favourite things. Um, <laughs> I, I love the, the hope as well in powering uh, things in, in cloudy countries, um, like the one that we're in today, especially with the weather that was awful earlier on. Um, how does this um, relate to the research that you're actually doing? How does this sit amongst uh, and all the things you've got crush on? I'm starting my second year as a bachelor, so I'm not very much into uh, like this kind of breakthrough research. But uh, I wish to pursue something about sensors, and I was also considering uh, alternative energies. And uh, this year I will start working a bit with uh, same strata deposits, which has to do something with solar panels. But uh, I don't think it, I need to go into very much detail because <laughs> it wouldn't be suited for it. <laughs> You said one of the problems in these potentially new, very much more efficient solar cells using bacteria is keeping the bacteria alive. Yeah. Is that because there's nowhere of putting a, a food source in there? What, what, what do the bacteria uh, eat? No. Uh, the bacteria need to be coated in that layer of, uh, it's a sem semiconductor, so we can uh, use the energy they produce. And while coating them in that uh, material, they usually die. So we need, to, I don't know, <laughs> yeah, that's sad. But uh, <laughs> uh, they also are E. coli, so <laughs> you have to <laughs> uh, weigh things a bit. Um, maybe, I don't know, I was thinking about trying to find uh, an organic substance that might work as a semiconductor. Probably they're working on this already. It would be really nice if they succeeded, because these things already proved very efficient. I saw a great talk about um, yeah. uh, improved photovoltaics using perovskite. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't know about it. I, I mean, I've heard about it, but I don't know very much about it. Good. I thought that would finish this on a big high note. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Can we please thank one more time, Marina Stigaro? It's a bit mean to ask somebody who's working about this in a kind of uh, dilettante way, like she says, falling in love with these things about a very specific thing, but I did see a great talk about perovskite semiconductors last week. Now next we head due south from Romania to, test of geography here, Bulgaria, yeah, but you, do you know that? That's insider knowledge, I think, from where you're sitting in the audience. So that is right, Bulgaria, that's right. And we're going to go to 2019 FameLab Bulgaria finalist Viktor Senderov. Now, fitting in with tonight's World Wide Web's theme, Victor's another of our finalists working collaboratively across borders, and in his case, he's at Sweden's equivalent of where we are tonight, which is the Stockholm's Swedish Museum of Natural History. Now, he's a computational phylogeneticist using programming pro and processing power to provide insights into the hidden links between species. So another quick pop quiz. Besides other primates, what animal is closest to humans? Come on, just shout out something. Pig, did you say pig? Pig, that's a lovely thought. I mean, I know from our behavior and the House of Commons, you might well think so, but yes. Parrots? Wow, I love the way you're... Basically, as long as it begins with a P, it's closely related to people. It's a, it's, I like the logic. Any other panel, any, any thoughts? A shrew? No, no, it's not. It is. It's a whale. No, it's not. It is, in fact, just just take this home as an interesting fact. The closest thing, which is closest because it's closest to all primates, are colugos. Colugos, which are often known as flying lemurs, which is not strictly accurate because they're not lemurs and they don't fly. Uh, but you find them mostly in Indonesia and the Philippines. But they are the nearest thing to primates. That's my that's my little mini fame lab presentation I'm throwing in now, Victor who has nothing to do with work on Kalugos, is using cutting edge AI to try to reveal more evolutionary connections. He's looking right across speciation and diversity and the many factors that can affect types and numbers of creatures in different regions of the planet. That is the gist, but to link it to the bits you've missed, let's have a bit of Bulgaria hysteria for our 2019 FameLab finalist, Viktor Senderov. living organisms are related. Uh, it is intuitive that birds are related, or to some it may even be apparent that humans and chimps are relatives. Um, 
But it is astounding that I and this pineapple share a grand, 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 grand mother. That, that's right, you're my cousin. <laughs> how, how, how can that be? Evolution has been uh, conceptually understood since Darwin and Wallace. It is descent through modification. But if you want to um, answer scientific questions, quantitative questions, such as what's the relationship between humans, chimps, birds, and pineapples, uh, you have to put it into mathematical terms. In this particular example, you have to create a so-called phylogenetic model, and then you need to encode the solution to that model as a computer program. Um, unfortunately, state-of-the-art techniques uh, today often fail for complex uh, phylogenetic models, and we need to use simpler models for which we know the solution. I decided to do something about it, and I was inspired by the advances in AI research where uh, um, people uh, uh, generate, uh, I mean, machines generate automatically images of cats and of pineapples. So uh, I decided to work on a, a programming language for phylogenetics, which has two features. One, you don't encode the solution, but you encode the evolutionary model as a program. And two, the solution then appears automatically sort of by machine uh, intelligence. And in order to do that, the computer simulates a large number of uh, alternative evolutionary histories, uh, so-called particles, and attaches a probability uh, to each of, of them. And then the solution is inferred as statistical distribution in a framework called probabilistic programming. <laughs> so, so the, the name of the language is tree people. Tree is a, as in the tree of life that binds all living things uh, together. With it, I hope to be able to address questions such as why are there so many uh, species in South America? Uh, do uh, whales and dolphins evolve at the same speed? Or how, how important were key innovations such as uh, feathers for the evolutionary history of Earth? But most Im importantly, what is the evolutionary relationship between humans and pineapples. <laughs> Super, thank you. Um, you know how um, it's often quoted that humans share 98, 90% of our yeah. DNA with chimpanzees? Yeah. Yeah. How much of our DNA do we share with a pineapple? Uh, I would have to guess. Uh, we, we share, let, let, let's put it in, in, in a different uh, way, we, we share some of the deepest, mostly conserved regions, like things that uh, uh, create uh, proteins, uh, um, um, deal, have to do with metabolism and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's not a big percentage, but, uh, but I, mean, I mean, only the fact that we share DNA with pineapples is astounding. I mean, like, we share anything, like, it's nothing like, like humans, but... but <laughs> But is, is, is still the same, same tree of life? Yeah. Yeah. You're saying you can recognize um, similar DNA sequences yeah. in pineapple yeah. as you see in humans and yeah. many yeah. species. Yeah, and, and, and just the fact that it's built out of DNA, it evolves in the same way, even, even that's already a similarity, even if the sequences are slightly different. Are there any other uses um, that you see for your tree people language? There are other things that you're yeah. considering modeling? For sure. So, so, so this language is so-called probabilistic programming language, um, which is um, I, so the difference between a deterministic and a probabilistic language is that every time the program runs, it produces a different output. Mm -hmm. Like in this way, you can simulate statistical distribution. So, everywhere you need to do some statistical inference, you you can use our language. Of course, there are other probabilistic programming languages out there. But uh, for sure, you could, you could use our engines in, in any field of science that uses statistics, which is all the fields of science. Do you have a hypothesis, starting hypothesis, yeah. for why there are so many species in South America? Uh, I, I, well, the hypothesis that we want to test is that this has something to do with the rise of the Andes. So when, when the Andes rose between 10 and 6 million uh, years ago, um, and um, sort of created a lot of habitats. So, so how, how does speciation occur? You have to have slightly different ecological niches for, um, uh, for
for species to form. So when you when the Andes rose, they had kind of the zone in 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 the lower parts where it was a little bit warmer, and then high up it was a little bit colder. Different. Uh, degrees of moisture, so this created like a very diverse habitat and diff a lot of niches for a lot of uh, um, uh, organisms. But we want to test that mathematically. This is what, what I want to say. Like Darwin and Wallace, they had like a good idea about uh, how evolution works, but they didn't test anything with uh, equations and stuff. So we, in the last hundred years, evolutionary biologists have been trying to make this more quantifiable. Okay, niches for species and applause, please, for our finest Victor Sanderoff and his pineapple cow. I like the fact that Victor seemed constantly amazed by how different he was from a pineapple. And I also like the fact that when we had examples from the audience, we had pigs and parrots, and then we had a pineapple produced as well. Now, penultimately, we've lecturer in applied nuclear physics at Surrey University, Caroline Shenton Taylor, who I just learned was in the audience for the very first ever Fame Lab, UK only Fame Lab, way back in 2005, which was nearly wrecked by Robert Winston, Lord Winston. But that is another story I've told twice tonight, and if you find me in the bar, I'll tell it again. Uh, but then Caroline, nine, just nine years later, plucked up the courage to enter Fame Lab in the UK herself and won it. After a 2014 win, she used the prize money to launch a space balloon in honour of pioneering inventor and explorer of sky and sea, August Picard. Uh, this is the Picard, by the way, who some of you might have heard of, who was both the role model for, tip for uh, Professor Calculus in Tintin, he was completely based on him. And he's also partly used to inspire Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek. I'm not making either of those up. Now, Caroline's then continued to explore and explain science in all sorts of entertaining ways, from stand-up comedy to radio programs to using juggling balls to show how Venn diagrams work. Her name is an anagram of an erotic loony enthralls. So stand by to be enthralled not necessarily erotically, by Caroline Shenton Taylor. What would you do if your friend advised you not to do something? Would you listen to your friend or would you ignore them? This is the adventure of the scientist who ignored Einstein and in doing so helped connect us to the stars. So the scientist I'm talking about is Picard, and in 1931, Picard was about to enter the record books. He wanted to get above the clouds to measure scientific data, but to get there, he needed to redesign a hot air balloon. Gone were the wicker baskets, and he engineered a two-meter aluminium sphere pot. He climbed in, and the balloon took off. Picard flew so high, he became the first man to fly into the stratosphere. He looked down from 10 miles up and he saw the curvature of the Earth's surface. After his 17 hour flight, he crash landed. Now everyone thought Picard was dead, but he walked away from the wreckage. Overnight, Picard became a national hero, but his good friend Albert Einstein wrote to him and said, Picard, you must never fly again. Think of your family. Because for Einstein, space balloons were just too dangerous. But Picard was a man after data. And so a year later, he made another balloon flight, and he didn't tell Einstein he was going up. And on that flight, he carried an electrometer, a piece of metallic wire that deflects near charged particles. And as he floated above the clouds, that piece of wire deflected over and over and over again. He was measuring charged particles in the stratosphere for the first time. Now today, we know this is cosmic ray radiation. And it can come about when a star dies. Because when a star collapses, it kicks out energetic particles. And some of them hurtle through the universe, and they hit our atmosphere. And when that happens, they undergo secondary interactions, and they give us extra particles down here on the Earth's surface. Now, if you were to hold out your hands, you have one muon particle passing through every fingernail every minute. Now, you can't see the muon particles, you can't feel them, you can't taste them but they rain down on us all the time. And the neat thing about the muon particle is that it scatters near high density material. So scientists have measured the flux of muons outside pyramids and outside volcanoes and used the measurements to work out the interior of the structure without going inside. And I've looked at the path of muons scattering through cargo containers and used it to track hidden nuclear smuggled material. 
And I love how the muons connect us to a star that dies millions of light years away that we never see, yet the muon particles rain down on us. And as for Picard's family, well, a few years later, his sister-in-law, Jeanette, she became the first woman to fly to the stratosphere. She, too, saw the curvature of the Earth. And so sometimes I think it goes to show that you should ignore your friends, even if your friend happens to be Albert Einstein. Thank you. Presentation. Um, I like how we use this knowledge to track smuggled materials, but actually, I want to ask you about the car. Mm -hmm. And because we have like a lot of people in the audience who want to go into science professionally, do you think there is still room for like scientists who are going to do really risky things? Because now a lot of it is done through AI, computers, etc. Yeah. So do we still get like the maverick scientists who do really, really risky stuff? I hope so. I think, um, I think in Picard's era when he did it, there, there was health and safety, um, and health and safety told him that he had to wear a helmet on the flight, and his solution was to wear a wicker basket, because he thought if he crashed, the helmet's going to be no good anyway. And I kind of like that slightly cavalier attitude. Um, I work with radiation, so I have to be very health and safety conscious, and yes, we do a lot of AI modelling, but I think sometimes you have to take the data yourself, and sometimes a human needs to be there to make the interaction, and I think that's why we're trying to send people to Mars, because we could send a robot, but I think the human will see things potentially differently than maybe our I, I am in space. So yeah, I think there's still room. But I'm not the maverick, and I'm not flying in space. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not going to Mars? Uh, no. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll do the calculations this day. <laughs> um, I'm tempted to ask you whether you've got uh, Albert Einstein type friends who kind of uh, discourage oh. you from doing certain experiments. But I, I won't ask you that. Um, I want to go a little bit. It's a good question. Okay, fine, we'll go with that and then ask my next question. So have I ignored Albert Einstein type friends? Yeah. Um, occasionally. So my other half is a scientist and he'll give me helpful suggestions for my work and I will helpfully ignore him some of the time. Um, and he does likewise to me, so yeah, I have, I have. Uh, My question was about Jeanette. Um, so yeah. when she went up, was there anything cool that she discovered that she saw for the first time? So she flew with August's twin brother. So his twin brother was also a balloonist and they went together. Um, but then I think she made the first solo female flight. So rather than getting the data, she was up there as a kind of a pioneer um, actually undertaking the mission and flying the balloon. Because the balloons were really dangerous, because they had hydrogen in the balloons, not helium. Because of the, the war, the hydrogen was what they had to use, and of course that's really flammable. So I think rather than getting the, the data, she was pioneering and actually being there in space. Yeah. But there's not so much written about her. It's only a and a quick bonus question for me, because I'm also, <laughs> I'm also a Picard fan as well. What, made you, what first made you so interested in him? Because there's so many other more famous scientists, figures from that era. So when I did my PhD, I looked at the Newton Calorie materials, and Picard discovered the Newton Calorie effect. I then worked with some nuclear materials, and Picard discovered uranium-235. I then worked with nuclear materials, and Picard did muons. So every stage throughout my career, Picard just seems to be in the background. But his last thing was to design a ship that sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and I'm not doing that. Which he adapted from the very same yeah. ship he'd used yeah. in the sky as well. Yeah. So, and, and does he just need better PR? Are you his PR person? I think Picard's a champ, but you might have heard of his uh, grandson. Bit trend. So he's the one who's trying to fly around the world with solar aeroplanes and solar boots. So. so it goes on for another yeah, generation. Okay, one more time for Picard, <laughs> PR person, Caroline Clinton Taylor. And I should say that Caroline Shenton Taylor is also an anagram of total loony in research, although that is that is in with two ends, like a pub, so it doesn't quite work. Now, last but statistically unlikely to be least, with 2018 Fame Lab Greece finalist Socrates Mosellas. And appropriately, Socrates Morsellus is an anagram of last amorous kisser. That's appropriate as in being the last fame labber tonight, not particularly interested in the amorous kisser part. But he does say he's passionate about computers and more generally the way machines work. And such was that passion that even though he'd actually originally got a degree in chemical engineering, Socrates kept being drawn to software engineering and computing. And he is now studying for an MSc in data science and analytics at Cardiff University. He says FameLab has helped him to put his passion into words, rather than, say, amorous kissing. So allow him three minutes to seduce you now. Please give a clamorous, amorous welcome to our final FameLab of the evening, Socrates Mosellas. Hi, everyone. So the other night, someone broke into my house, and he was like, your money or your life. And I was like, dude, I'm a programmer. Okay, I'm sorry, and he left. <laughs> that was a joke, but 
what I meant is that it's believed that we programmers have neither money nor life. So now either, maybe some of you might have both of these, but each and every one of you deep inside hides a little programmer too. Let me explain. First of all, what is programming? By definition, programming is setting a specific set of instructions someone needs to follow in order to create a, res a result. And this is not only true for computers and programming, but also for everyday lives. Also, remember that computers were developed by people just like you and me. A bit crazier. But like you and me. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, so let me explain to you now some principles that we use not only in computers, but in our everyday lives without even knowing it. Let's begin. First of all, the if statement. I if statement means that if something happens, then we need to follow a set of instructions. So, for example, if it's going to rain, I'm going to bring an umbrella. The second one is called while statement. And it means that while something is true, we need to follow another set of instructions. A simple example of that would be while it's a weekday and from 9 to 5, we have to be at work or at university. Third, and last but not least, we both use functions. Computers and us use functions in our everyday lives, which is a defined set of steps, which we only need to define once, and then we can use it as many times as we want. For example, walk. I just learned how to walk, how to walk once, and now I just need a point A and a point B, and I walk. What I love about programming is that it's a very creative thing, and I was not a creative person. So it's a, crea it's a creative thing because it follows three steps to success. First, you need to think about something then you need to act for it, do something for it, because if you just think it, then nothing is going to happen. And only then can you unlock the third step, which is to actually create and be proud of what you created. So whatever you do in your lives, even if it's not programming, and I didn't convince you that you're programmers, think, act, and you'll be able to create anything you want. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Socrates. Um, I want to unpick something that you that you said there um, towards the end. That your your uh, programming is creative, but you're not a creative person. Okay, shall I explain that? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> well, until the third year of the university, I didn't try anything. I, I was just going to my classes. I was following my classes, so I passed the lesson. So that was a good thing. Uh, but I didn't try to create something of my own, and. Only through programming, I could think something that was never done before and actually do it. Because for some reason, I love that I could write something on my computer and see it on my screen, or on my telephone, or on my mobile phone. So it made me want to create. That's my so it awakened your inner creative person. So you hadn't yeah. expressed it before. Exactly. Tell us about. Um, a program you've created, what's it, what does it do? So, the first thing I have created was a program to book tickets. Everyone does that, but it was the most exciting thing for me because it was the first time I got to experience how to um, program a button, and how to use a button, and how to actually uh, play with data. So, the most exciting thing I have done was the first thing I have done, uh, which is it was just everything about programming. And what's you working on at the moment? What program are you working on now? Now I'm not working on anything because I just started an MSc in data science. <laughs> okay. So I'm trying to work out life. <laughs> <laughs> While you don't have to, if you enjoyed that, please give applause to our final <laughs> favourite of the evening, Socrates Mosellas. Now, Socrates Mosellas is also an anagram of serious moral tasks, which is sort of what faces our judges now. Judges, you have six minutes. That is just the length of two FameLab presentations to decide. Just remember on one winner uh, who is going to get signed copies of Ast Ad Astra by the Calipogean uh, Dallas Campbell, and also exactly by Simon Winchester, whose buttocks I don't know well enough to pass comment on. Uh, but only one will also get the singular honour of being the 2019 Fable Champion. So one winner 
two joint runners up, off you go, and like the Supreme Court, you do not have extra time, but we need extra wisdom from you and probably less constitutional impact. Can we send them on their way with some applause, please, for Tim, Anne-Marie and Christina? Now, while they're rapidly ruminating, we're going to have the audience vote, but just before you do, as a little sort of amuse-bouche, I am delighted to have with us someone who just last year was one of the judges for Hall of Fame Lab. Prior to that, many, many moons ago, in 2013, she was a Fame Lab UK finalist. She is now Science Education Manager and Fame Lab Manager at Cheltenham Festivals. Uh, so please welcome to the stage, Elspeth Kenny. Dance now. No, no. now this, you're in charge of Fame Lab, but you're also in charge of Fame Lab Academy. We haven't really said what Fame Lab Academy is, but this is a kind of exciting, growing baby thing that's getting big. Yeah, absolutely. So a cool thing about Fame Lab is it's links to um, an education project um, that I also run for 14-year-olds. And at the moment, it's only in Gloucestershire, but we do have 22 schools taking part. So it's Fame Lab, but for 14-year-olds in school. Um, and the teachers get training um, in science communication. They're linked up with a STEM mentor or, or a Fame Lab alumni. Um, and these yeah, young people um, learn how to communicate science. Um, and I'm just going to stick it in because you mentioned it's only in Gloucestershire. We established with the Romania-Bulgaria question that geography is not necessarily the long suit of the audience. So Gloucestershire, because it's country. Cheltenham, is in Gloucestershire, and that is where the Science Festival is, where this all began. Just thought I'd clarify that. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, and what's really cool um, about Fame Lab Academy is that we get pupils who might not, who might think that science isn't for them. So they might get into it because they're into public speaking, um, and and then they realise that science is is all around them. So we've had pupils who. Um, get in trouble fairly regularly for example and are forced to you know research a, a three minute talk and present it in front of their class and they're really into bikes for example so they'll research all about what the bike is made of and friction all of that all of that stuff and then the science teachers have got this hook in they're like oh you know about the materials of bikes that's science and um, it's going to be because it's really cool. with, with most fame lovers they tend to talk about the area around their research but when you're a 14 year old unless you're Peter Parker, you're not doing your own research, yeah. are you? So this is where you have to talk about your bike or other things and find the science within it. Absolutely. So there's something, they find something that they're interested in. So there's an example of a, a girl whose mum was allergic to morphine, so she found out about that. Um, a lot of them are really into dreams. They like, they like, get, like finding out more about dreams and nightmares. We've had some good talks on that. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, and so we're hoping to grow it. It's gone from, this is the sixth year that it's run, um, and we've gone from six schools to 22. Um, so I'm quite busy. It's great. You know there are a lot more schools in the UK than 22. <laughs> I'm trying, How big I'm could trying. This get? I'm trying. Yeah, it could, it could get really big. So um, a lot of the countries that do Fame Lab uh, across the globe um, have their own schools versions that are called slightly different things but are sort of similar. Um, and we've set up a, an international link with some schools in France that do a similar thing to Fame Lab Academy with a uh, school near Cheltenham Festivals that does Fame Lab Academy. So we set up this international science communication link between 14 year olds, which is also pretty cool. So yeah, it could, it could get bigger and bigger. Last year I went to Astana, I was working in Astana for the British Council, but I saw the Fame Lab Academy Kazakhstan version with a very excited audience of over a thousand people. So it can get huge. Now what about Fame Lab itself? Now we, and it's part of, we said it has its origins at the Cheltenham Science Festival. The international final is still held at the Cheltenham Science Festival. This is your chance to give a little plug here. So I'm from Cheltenham Festivals. Here's our logo. Um, <laughs> so Cheltenham Festivals, you might have heard of some of our festivals. So we have a music festival, a jazz festival, which is music, but we separate them. Um, and uh, we've which got... Which kind of jazzers would appreciate. <laughs> they quite like that kind of yeah. separating out the beat from the yeah. music, so they'll like that, yeah. It can be more edgy that way. Yeah. Um, and then we've got the Literature Festival kicking off a week today, which is, um, which is huge, which I'm really excited about. We've got Tan France coming from Queer Eye. Yeah. Um, and bigger people, that's the main one I'm excited about. Um, but Channel Festival, Science Festival, right. Um, so I like that you tested the Venn diagram of Natural History Museum, European yeah. Researchers Night, and Queer Eye for the Straight Guy audience. Yeah. See, see what's in the middle there. Not the as much as you hoped for, I think. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's the first one I went for. Nadia Hussein, Bake Off? Right, Venn diagram. Who I like did this the juggling? Get some diagram? more data points, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the Literature Festival. Yeah, so the, so the Science Festival is in June. It's uh, six days um, in the first week of June. Um, 
and it's absolutely amazing. So um, we have FameLab happening in all sorts of countries, I think 25 this year, but up to 30. Um, and we get all of those finalists, um, all of those winners from all of those countries, and they come to this small town in the southwest of England um, for this science festival. Um, and they, it's a real, it forms that real global community, that alumni um, global community that um, we were talking about earlier. Um, and it's amazing celebration of um, global research and they make these connections and it's a real celebration um, and the competition's a small part of it. It's more about collaboration and, and bringing all these this global community together in the West Country. And, and finally now that you've taken over being in charge of Fame Lab as well, do you, <laughs> yes. think, do you think we're finally going to crack Antarctica? Yes. It's the one continent we've not had a Fame Lab in. I will make it my pledge to right, take right. Fame Lab to Antarctica. You're all witnesses to that. Now, you are here with a secondary purpose as well, so we got you to do that, but we're also going to get you to, to help with the audience vote. So, it's a difficult thing to do. Now, I understand if this was actually at Cheltenham, we'd give you all little pads and there'd be kind of refreshers and things like this, or we'd do it. We're not going to do that. This is a fun night, so what we're going to do is just go for who shouts the loudest. Now, just to first of all, I'm going to just give you a quick reminder of who you've seen. So do not cheer at this point. Save your vocal cords for them. So you've seen, this is the order they're going to come out in. Decide who you're going to go for. So we had the FameLab Ireland finalist, uh, Luisa Vasheska. FameLab Switzerland champion, Dmitry Kopolyansky. FameLab Romania finalist, Melina Strugaru. Uh, from Bulgaria, we had Victor Senderov. We had our 2014 UK winner, Caroline Shinton taylor and I hope you can remember that about two minutes ago you were watching our Greek finalist, Socrates Moselas. He's waving at you just in case. So now comes the bit where you pump up the volume. Again, please try and put aside such factors as nationality, geographical proximity, subject familiarity, suitability in a romantic Venn diagram, choice of shirt. Just vote or yell whatever you do on the basis of who you thought did the best presentation and coped best with the judges' questions. Now we're just going to do a quick control first, to check the audience are working. I'll shout out a few names, let's see how noise you make. So let's try, start with uh, Greta Thunberg. I think she's Boris worried. Johnson. <laughs> Interesting. Brian Cox. And Elspeth Kenny. <laughs> Fine, now this is for real. Are we ready, audience? Are we ready, Elspeth? You will only get one pass at this. So here we go first, our polished Polish Fame Lab Ireland finalist, Louisa Bashevska. <laughs> you, you don't clap as well, that's going to make it complicated, right? Okay. Uh, from Russia, but a winner in Fame Lab Switzerland, Dmitry Kopolyansky. <laughs> Our best from Bucharest, Fame Lab Romania finalist, Malina Strugaru. Yeah. From the area of Bulgaria, but now working in Sweden, Viktor Sendorov. Yeah. 2005 Fame Lab UK Observer, 2014 winner, Caroline Shenton Taylor. Yeah. Slight bit of home field advantage there. And finally, our green pair in the gift of the gab, Socrates Morcellas. <laughs> Elspeth Kenny. Now the prize they are competing for, I should say, is, is no mere bauble or token. It's no trophy. It's not even a book token or a two-for-one pet voucher for pizzas. It is the honor of being the 2019 Hall of Fame Lab audience vote winner, plus, a signed or singed copy, their choice, of Dallas Campbell's Ad Astra. Who do you think aged it, Elspeth? Greta Thunberg. No. Um, <laughs> um, this is a, I reckon, everyone's. Uh, Pineapple King. Whoa! <laughs> I like that, just Pineapple King. Come and get your prize, come on up to the stage, thank you. It was the pineapple that did it in the end. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Well done, congratulations. And he gets, he gets the book as well. Thank you very much indeed. Now, now, can we also get now onto the stage the equivalent of Elspeth? You might be coming back, of course. There may be other prizes as well. So this is the equivalent of Elspeth at the British Council, uh, their science advisor and fame lab maestro, Adrian Fenton. 
And before we bring back the judges, you want to say something very just brief. A brief words. Yeah, I like when I walked in the door, I heard Pineapple King being shouted out. That was just great timing. Um, I'm Adrian Penton, I work for the British Council. We um, organise tonight as part of our work. And, but the British Council is one of those organisations that you might not know much about. Um, so this is a chance for you to perhaps come and chat with some of the people here or ourselves to find out a little bit more. As the UK's organisation that links uh, culture and educational links with countries around the world, there's a lot of opportunities out there. We, we, people might not realise that the British Council do work in science, but it's been in our remit since the original charter came up. So there's a lot of other programmes that we're involved in, arts connections with other countries, music, society projects, working with the Premiership Football League, um, we, about get, using that as a, to break down barriers in other countries. And there's opportunities um, for you. So if you've not heard much about the British Council, perhaps you'd like to come and have a chat with us afterwards. And also, um, you know, Fame Lab relies on its partners. We work very well with the Cheltenham uh, festivals in the UK, but there are over 200 partners around the world, and many of them tonight are doing things in other countries as part of European researchers nights. Some of uh, your, the people here, I'm sure, know of friends back home who are involved in events. So, so it's very much about that linking things, and FameLab really relies on that, the media companies that make it massive in other countries around the world. And without their support, uh, we wouldn't be where we are tonight. I have the privilege of um, working with the different countries. I don't get to go to them all, maybe one or two a year. Um, and it's a great job. So um, thank you very much for coming along tonight. And I won't hold you any more from the judges, who's now seem to be ready. OK, stand over here, please. We're going to bring back the judges, please. Please welcome back Anne-Marie and Afghan, Tim Slingsby and Christina Nelligan. So. Your main purpose of being here, Adrian, is to hand over these small but exquisite trophy that they're going to announce in a moment. So, you're meant to officially come up with your verdict. Do, do sit down as well. I mean, <laughs> you can't sit, I don't know, as well. Now, remember, you're, you're judging on these three criteria of content, clarity, and charisma. You're also coming up with two joint runners-up and one winner. So, I don't know how you want to divide up the task between you, but in whichever order, but if we can do... Run us up first and then win it, and maybe if you want to say something about the incredible difficulty you had coming to a decision in six minutes flat. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to say some brief instructive words and then name the first runner up, first equal runner up. Uh, it's complex. Uh, yes, so um, clearly um, each of the participants has a huge amount of charisma and good depth of knowledge of their, of their subject. So it was extraordinarily difficult to pick out uh, prize winners. Uh, and we were all agreed that every single participant has a huge uh, array of opportunities in to tell the world about the joy and wonder of science. Hugely impressed. But without further ado, and without faffing around too much, the first equal runner-up was somebody who really impressed us with the analogy they drew that really brought the audience into a better understanding of the subject and really engage the audience throughout the, this person's presentation as well. So the first equal runner-up is Dimitri. Well done, Dimitri. And you get a copy of this brilliant book as well. Okay, so bear in mind, this is the next joint runner-up. This is the linear nature of time. These are equal. This is not a third and a second. They are both simultaneously coexisting. And is one of the others of you going to take that one? Christina. Um, so the second equal runner-up is a presenter that definitely um, had us discussing that we absolutely want to go back and Google um, what they said in their presentation uh, for a number of reasons. And we have a, a lot of questions after this is all um, finished. So good content, good presentation, had us all asking questions and wanting to know more. Um, and the prize goes to Caroline Senton-Taylor. <laughs> Well done, Caroline. Right, uh, well that's that, oh no, hang on, yes, we've still got one more to do, and that is the winner. And I'm guessing, Anne-Marie, since you haven't said anything yet, this is, this is your speaking part. <laughs> yes, so uh, our winner that we've chosen this evening is someone who uh, managed to cover a lot of content in their presentation, um, went into a lot of depth, um, was incredibly clear with what they were communicating but of course brought, brought charisma, um, but it is mostly the, the content that they, they've won it on. Um, and in particular, we're impressed with um, their ability to answer questions and go even more deeper into the content. Um, so our winner is... 
dramatic pause. I like it, I like it. And another one. <laughs> Victor Senderoff. Hey! Hey! Congratulations, Victor, get that. Wow, are you going to divide the prize equally with your pineapple? <laughs> and, and the trophy as well. Well, that is, up. that is it. We're not going to keep you any longer because I know it's a big European researchers night. But can we please thank our winners, our judges. Thank you to everybody uh, from Cheltenham and the British Council who's made this happening. Thank you for all coming along. You are all equally Calipigian. Uh, go off and enjoy the rest of European Researchers Night. I hope this will be a memorable one, particularly if we do go ahead with Brexit. It could be the last one as well, as a cheerful thought. Uh, I am Quentin Cooper at Quentin, your host. Thank you for coming along, and I hope to see you at Hall of Fame Lab, or maybe even at Fame Lab in Cheltenham. Thank you.